So good to be together. Well, this morning, as John mentioned, we do have the, uh, the wonderful privilege of having a, uh, a guest preacher uh, this morning. Uh, this, would, uh, this man would represent uh, a number of things. He would represent, uh, as you know, we're a part of a family of churches called Sovereign Grace Churches. And this man in his church, uh, LifeGate Church in Seguin, Texas, would represent partnership in that family of churches. So the reason that we're in partnership is because of uh, this man and others like him and other churches uh, like LifeGate uh, that partner together with us to support us, to encourage us to come alongside and, and help churches like this one to be planted. Uh, in fact, we have another, there's another man here uh, this morning uh, who is currently out of the room uh, who represents another church plant in Philadelphia uh, that was planted last year, uh, Risen Hope Church. Uh, and so we have a number of representations of our partnership with Sovereign Grace. The reason that we have this man coming this morning, Josh Jordan, who in my life, uh, I have, you know, like many of you, I have a number of, of good friends that God has given uh, to me over the course of my life. Um, I don't have any who are as close, you know, are, there, there are none who are closer uh, than Josh Jordan. Uh, Josh Jordan was, uh, was my first small group leader uh, 10 years ago now. He led our small group and uh, mentored me, uh, discipled me, his wife. Uh, they came alongside my wife and I. Uh, they have children that are the same ages as our children. Uh, when I look to, when I look for help uh, and, um, you know, in, in the midst of things that John and I are talking about, uh, I look to Josh. He's a, he's a wise counselor. He's a biblically minded man. He is a man who is uh, who's not about himself uh, or about his ministry, but who's about Jesus Christ who's about the gospel. Uh, he is a wise pastor, and he's a powerful preacher, as you'll experience this morning. We asked Josh in, uh, not because he's a good friend of ours, uh, he is that, uh, but we don't simply ask good friends of ours to come in and preach. We asked him to come in and preach uh, because he's a man who's given uh, to God's word, who is uh, controlled by the Holy Spirit as he speaks. So you'll experience that in just a moment. Uh, so I do want to invite Josh to come up on stage to deliver God's word to us, and please welcome our friend, Josh Jordan. Well, good morning. I hope everyone had a wonderful Christmas time with your family, and just a blessed last few days and it is great to be with you this last day of or this last sunday of 2015 and i look forward to just serving you anytime i get to preach god's word it is a joy and a privilege and today it is great to be with you guys because i think i was thinking about this on the way up i think this is maybe our fifth or sixth time to be with you guys since you started two years ago so um, John and Aaron, if it's okay with you, we would like to become honorary members, if, if that's all right. We, we love this church. Uh, we love uh, your pastors. Uh, of course, we know um, Everett and Stacy, and just love them. And, and so we're just in, grateful to be in partnership. As Aaron was saying, we are in partnership as a church, which means more than just some denominational structure. It really involves a lot of relationship. And I thank God for these guys in my life, for John and just the friendship that we've gotten to develop since he's moved here. And then as Aaron said, we've known each other a long time. And I'm not responsible for anything in Aaron since he said I was his home group leader 10 years ago. I'm not responsible for any of the, the, those things. The good, I'll take credit for. The bad, I'm, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I love Aaron to death. And, and we just enjoy being here with you guys this morning. Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 2. We're going to be in verses 13 through 23, and I simply want to do one thing this morning. This has really been a burden of mine that I just want to make sure that sometimes it's the simple truths that are the truths we're most quick to forget. And I just want to send, share with you a simple truth, a single truth that I think is one of those truths that if we forget, if we lose sight of, it will have repercussions in, in our Christian life. See, this truth I want to share with you this morning is central to the storyline of the Bible, and it's simply this. God is calling ordinary people 
to be a part of his extraordinary plan of redemption. Let me say that again. God is calling ordinary people to be a part of his extraordinary plan of redemption. Now, this morning, I primarily want to talk to believers, Christians, people who put their faith in Jesus Christ. But if you're here this morning and you are not a Christian, first of all, let me say, we are so glad you are here. And I'm so glad that you are here hearing God's word proclaimed. And I just want to share with you, even though I'm talking primarily to Christians, I think that today could serve you in this way. I hope and pray it will be a window into what Christianity is really about. And if, if you see it in this statement, it really is about grace. It really is that God doesn't save people according to their worth, and God doesn't use people because they're worthy, because they're good enough. So whether on the front end we don't get saved because of anything in us, and once we get saved, God doesn't use us because of something impressive about us. It is all grace. So I want us to just think about this statement. God is calling ordinary people to be a part of his extraordinary plan of redemption. And as I said a minute ago, if we forget this truth, I think we're in danger of two errors. On one side, I think if we forget this truth that God uses ordinary people to do his uh, to be a part of his extraordinary plan, one of the things that can happen is we can become complacent. We can think, I'm so grateful for my salvation. I'm so grateful that God loves me and has saved me and that I get to be a part of his kingdom. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm not gifted like John and Aaron. I may not be able to be a part of, you know, the ministry up here on the stage. So God, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm quiet. I'm not, I don't have some big gift. And so I'm just going to do my thing, and, and we just kind of feel like maybe God could never use us. And we grow complacent in thinking, well, the mission is something I long to do, but, you know, I probably just, I probably am just good here, just doing my thing. And yet, if we realize the call that God has for each one of us, and that God uses ordinary people to do his extraordinary work, to be a part of his extraordinary plan of redemption, then it'll keep us from being complacent. Here's another danger, though. On the, on the other side, and this is more where I fall, I think we can easily grow discouraged if we forget this truth. Because maybe we really desire to be used by the Lord. Maybe we really do want to use our gifts. But once again, we think, I really am not all that impressive. I don't know that I have a gift that really could be used of the Lord. And we look at other people and we compare ourselves. We say, I could see how God could use them, but I don't know how God could use me. And we become discouraged as we look at how God is using other people and think, man, they're fruitful, but my life is not fruitful. So I hope this truth keeps us balanced from either being complacent or discouraged. And in God's kindness, he reminded me of this truth a little over a year ago when I was at one of these places of growing discouraged, wondering, God, am, are you using me? Am I, am I being used for your kingdom the way I desire? And God took me to this text in Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 23. I think this is one of these texts that often we can just read pass and miss some of the depth, some of the wisdom that is here in these verses. So in just, a moment, in just a moment, I want to read it. But before I do, let me give you a little bit of context. The context leading up to these passages is that Jesus has now been born. And there's these people coming from the east, wise men, magi that are coming to visit him. And there's a king named Herod who is eager to kill Jesus out of envy and jealousy. And he's asking these men, when you find out where he is, let me know so I can worship him, which was not true. He really wanted to come once he knew where Jesus was located and kill Jesus. And then in the middle of this story, we, we encounter a man named Joseph. A man we don't really know a lot about. 
But we find him here in these verses, and here's what we do know about Joseph. He is, at this point, the legal husband of Mary. At that time, engagement is different from our culture. They were betrothed, which means they weren't fully married, but they were legally married. If Joseph would have died, Mary would have been a widow. So he's the legal husband of Mary and the legal father of Jesus, the adopted father of Jesus. And he's been given this immense privilege of being a part of God's great plan and being the father of the long-awaited Messiah who is God in the flesh. And so we come to these verses with that context, and this is what we read starting in verse 13. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and he took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt, I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. And he sent and he killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation. Rachel, weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and he took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and he lived in a city called Nazareth that was spoken by the prophets that which was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled. He shall be called a Nazarene. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless the preaching of his word. Father, this morning, I pray that as we've already sung these songs and now as we encounter your word, that we would know without a doubt your great love for us. You love us in ways, Lord, our minds will never understand. But as we sing early, what our minds may not understand, our hearts are filled with praise. And we thank you for loving us. And one of the many ways that you have shown your love to us outside of the most important way of sending your son is you've given us your word. You haven't left us to guess what kind of God you're like. You have clearly revealed yourself to us. Thank you for your revelation this morning. I pray that as your revelation is given, that we would be eager to receive it with hearts, Lord, that are humble, Lord, hearts that are hungry, Lord, hearts that are filled with hope, not because life is easy, or because our circumstances are, are, are perfect, but because our eyes are fixed on you. You are the God who gives hope. Father, I pray that as we end this year and begin a new year, Lord, our hearts would be filled with the hope you give. And Father, I pray that you would do that by using your word in this message. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, like I said a minute ago, we don't know a lot about Joseph. He's only found in the early part of Jesus's life. So well, later on, when you get to Jesus's ministry years, there's no talk of Joseph, which leads us to believe he had probably died by that point. So we know little about Joseph, but what we do know is significant. And here's what it is. Joseph appears to be an ordinary man. Surprise. 
He's, he's just an ordinary man, but God used him to carry out his extraordinary plan. God used this ordinary man, just like he used Mary, who was just an ordinary lady, to be a part of his extraordinary plan of redemption. And I think there are two vital lessons that I have learned through this passage and through the story of scripture that I want to remind each one of us of this morning as we close out this year and we begin a new year. Here's the first one. God does extraordinary work through the faithful obedience of ordinary people. God does extraordinary work through the faithful obedience of ordinary people. Don't miss something so simple but so profound in the text we just read. Guess what happened in this passage besides what's going on with Herod and the wise men? When we look at Joseph, here's what we see. God told Joseph to do something. Joseph did it and God used him. Look at verses 13 and 20. God tells Joseph, rise and go. He tells him through this angel. Joseph did not volunteer for the job. Joseph didn't come up with the plan to get away from Herod. Joseph simply heard from God and did what God told him to do. Because we read later on in verses 14 and 21 that after the angel said, rise and go, Joseph heard God's revelation responded to it, and God used Joseph to carry out his extraordinary plan. Now, this may seem so simple, but like I said a minute ago, isn't it the simple truth that sometimes we're most quick to forget? Joseph didn't have some amazing gift. Joseph didn't have some amazing ability or history that God says, oh man, that, that guy's perfect. He was just an ordinary man. And yet God used him in an extraordinary way. And you're gonna see this in just a second, how God uses him in an extraordinary way. And all he did was he heard God, he did what God said, and God used him to carry out his redemptive purposes. So here's how God used Joseph in two specific ways that we see here in these verses. Here's the first one, and this is huge if you really think about it. The first one is Joseph was used to protect Jesus. Go back to verses 13 through 15, and we hear about this plot from Herod and it's the reason that the angels tell Joseph that he's to rise and he's to flee to Egypt and he's to remain there because Herod wants to kill Jesus. God gave Joseph this special and important task of protecting Jesus. Now we've got to come at this biblically and rightly with balance. Let me say clearly, God is sovereign in all things. His plans and his ways will never be thwarted. At the same time, human choices matter. And humanly speaking, if Joseph would have heard the angel and said, rise and go, and he says, no, I'm comfortable here, Jesus would have died. And there would have been no Calvary. Now we know, we can say, yeah, but, but God is sovereign. He wouldn't have let that happen. Yeah, but God entered into human history and you're right. God is sovereign, but he uses human means. And so Joseph, by responding to the angel's di directions and instructions, Jesus is saved. This is no small thing. We can just read right past that and, and, and miss how important this small act of obedience on Joseph's part, and it probably wasn't easy. Now we think, hey, he might've been an ordinary guy, but an angel showed up and told him this. Well, first of all, if you look through all the rest of the places in the Bible where God shows up and tells people something, it doesn't make it any easier to obey. It's still difficult. 
And before we make it too glamorous just because an angel showed up, still, it was probably hard for Joseph when you really think about Joseph's and Mary's condition. They probably weren't wealthy. So for them to pick up and to move to a place like Egypt was difficult. I'm sure Joseph was filled with lots of doubts. We think, well, if an angel told me something, I would do it. Really? If an angel showed, told me something, I'd probably lay there the next night and know, did that, was that really an angel? Did I really get that? Did I hear the angel right? Well, nobody else heard it. How do I know I'm not losing it? See, Joseph is just a normal man. It could have been easy for Joseph to ignore the instructions, but instead he obeyed. And he didn't just do it once. We read later on in verses 19 through 23, it happens again. Now it's time for them to go back home because Herod is gone, Herod is dead. But there's still that fear through Herod's son that Jesus could be killed. And once again, an angel shows up and tells Joseph, rise and go, not back to where you came from, but to the city of Nazareth. And then there's a second thing that God uses Joseph to do, not only to protect Jesus, but this is important. And once again, we see it right here in these verses, but he uses Joseph to fulfill prophecy. Look at verses 15 and verses 23. After Joseph obeys and goes to Egypt, we, Matthew records these words, that they remained there until the death of Herod, and this was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. A prophet named Hosea had prophesied, out of Egypt I have called my son. Hundreds of years before Jesus comes. And Joseph taking Jesus to Egypt made a way for that prophecy to be fulfilled. But that's not the only prophecy. We see another one in verse 23 when he's told not to go back to the district of Galilee. And he went and he lived in a city called Nazareth. That what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled. He shall be called a Nazarene. So way before he was born, yet again, hundreds of years, it was prophesied that the Messiah would be a Nazarene. And because Joseph obeyed, scripture was fulfilled. And this is a very important when you understand the book of Matthew. So there's four gospels that are all talking about the same person, but in a different way. And Matthew, though he's talking about the same Jesus that Mark and Luke and John are speaking of, he's speaking about Jesus from one primary lens. He wants everyone to understand that this Jesus is the one who fulfilled the Old Testament. He's speaking primarily to a Jewish audience who would, who would have wanted to know all of these prophecies they've grown up hearing from the time of their birth about the long expected Messiah. If you're saying this Jesus is him, you're gonna have to do a lot of work and prove it. And Matthew, in the first few chapters of his gospel, this is a huge thing Matthew does. He shows us time and time and time again that everything that was happening in Jesus' life was fulfilling everything that came in the Old Testament. And when you drop Joseph in the middle of the story, you see that Joseph played a part. It was important that Jesus could be authenticated by the Old Testament prophecies. And because he obeyed not once but twice, two prophecies were fulfilled that Matthew then shares to say to his audience, how do you know that this is the Messiah? How do you know this is the one you were to put all your trust in? You were to, to leave family? You were to take up your cross and follow him? How do you know this is the one? Let me give you all the ways in which he, he fulfills the Old Testament. And Joseph got to play a part in that. Ordinary obedience. But God used him to protect Jesus 
and to fulfill prophecies that pointed to how Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah. Now, if we were to zoom out for just a moment from this passage through the rest of the Bible, what we see in Joseph is true with all the rest of the Bible, isn't it? Think of any Bible character. They all share the same story as Joseph. God calls them to complete a certain task, and when they obey, God carries out his extraordinary plan. It's the same from Old Testament to New Testament. For example, take Moses. Now, if there's someone in the Old Testament that we could idolize, it would be Moses. But if you really read the story of Exodus and you see Moses, he's not this man that we look at him as. He didn't view himself in the same way. When God spoke to him and says, hey, Moses, I want you to go before the Pharaoh, the, the most powerful man on the planet, and tell him that you were to let my people go, Moses wasn't like, oh, God, yeah, sure. I mean, I've got the personality. I've got the background. I mean, if there's anybody that would know Egypt, I know Egypt. I come from, from Pharaoh's homes. I would know the inner workings of, of, of Pharaoh. God, good choice. No, if you read the Exodus story, Moses was, was terrified. Moses doubted. Moses tried to persuade God that he had the wrong man. We think of Moses as this, this figure that is so larger than life. No, he's no different than us. He doubted. He questioned. He said, but God, I, 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 don't, I don't speak well. And you want me to go before this guy, and I, I can't do this. See, isn't that the same struggles we have? But when God told Moses to do something, and Moses did it, God used Moses. Not because of anything in Moses. He was just obedient. Take Noah. Noah didn't come to God with a plan. God, he, didn't, he didn't come to God. None of these guys in the Bible that we read of ever took initiative. Moses didn't come before God and say, hey, God, I will be the man to lead God's people out of Egypt. Noah didn't come before God and say, God, I don't know if you've noticed, but the world is a mess. And I've got a plan. It's crazy. It's wild. It's really out there. But as bad as things are, I think you should completely wipe out everybody by a flood. I've been thinking about it, and I've been looking into this. I think I'm going to build a really huge boat. You're going to rescue my family, and we're going to start over. What do you think? That's not how God approached Noah. Noah is just a godly man who has righteous character, and God shows up and says, I'm going to do something that's just going to blow your simple, easy way of, of, of living out of the water. Here, here's what I'm, what I'm going to do. I am going to flood the earth, and I want you to be a part of my redemptive plan. Are you up for it, Noah? And when Noah did what God told him to do, God gave him the dimensions of the boat. God told him when to go. God told him when to close the door. God told him all of these things. Noah never had an idea of his own. He just did what God said, and when he did it, God carried out his extraordinary plan of redemption. Fast forward to the New Testament. Think of a man like the Apostle Paul. If Moses is our character in the Old Testament, we could idolize, I think, besides Jesus in the New Testament, we could idolize Paul as this character who, who is just so strong. They would probably never struggled with weakness. But once again, if we read Paul's words, just like if we read ex the Exodus story, Paul wasn't this guy with his chest out. Like, yes, I am the, the missionary to the Gentiles. You hear Paul's words and he says, I am the least of all the apostles. I'm amazed that God in his mercy saved me. He was often, not just humble, he was amazed. And we would think, yeah, but once again, it makes sense that God would use him because of his past. What a great story. The guy who used to persecute the church is now sharing 
the, the faith as the greatest missionary in the world. But that's not how Paul thought of his story. He didn't think, oh God, that's brilliant. I used to be the chief persecutor and now I'm the one getting persecuted. No, Paul looks at his past and it causes him to say, God, it is amazing that you would use me. And all Paul did was the same thing Moses and Noah and Joseph do. God says, go, open your mouth, proclaim this message. Sometimes people are gonna listen, sometimes they're gonna run you out of town, but guess what? Just say what I tell you to say, and I'm gonna work. And he preaches, and people get saved. And he preaches in another place, and they wanna kill him. Then he goes to another place and he preaches the same message and people get saved. All he did was respond in obedience. See, I, I want us to be aware of this because I think we can forget it. I can forget it. Being used by God is not based on our abilities, our ambition, or our personality. Maybe you're here this morning and you have grown complacent or discouraged in the work of God in your life because you think, I don't have X. I don't have certain abilities. I don't have a certain ambition. I don't have a certain testimony. I don't have a certain personality. And guess what? The Bible is filled with men and women that are different pasts, different personalities, and they all have one thing in common. It wasn't about any of those things. It was about when God showed up and says, do this, and they did it, God worked. How often do we forget this? I can tell you how often I forget it. I forget it regularly. One of the reasons I wanted to preach this message this morning, because not only I thought it was a great way to end this year, but because I can regularly struggle with this truth. I had to preach it to myself this week. Because you know what? I'm a guy who regularly struggles with feeling inadequate. Feeling like, God, am I doing enough? Am I making a difference? And I think the church is filled with many people who have large hearts, who want to see God's work done. But maybe you're discouraged. Maybe you feel like me, inadequate. And you think, how could God ever use me? Do you know my past? I don't have a personality for that. And I just want to tell you this morning, that that is not how God uses us. It's not based on those things. God is not using us because of our ability. God uses us just when we're faithful and obedient to whatever he tells us to do. Being used by God is about being faithful to God's call on your life. So can I just encourage you in some areas that maybe you and I are, are quick to forget? Don't underestimate the importance of marriage. If you're married, listen, we live in a culture that thinks lightly of marriage in every regard, not just in new laws that have been passed and our society's understanding of marriage, but there's even a new reality TV show called Marriage at First Sight where people meet someone and then get married and, and it's supposed to be fun. How small does our culture view marriage? You know what? Marriage is, is a glorious thing we see that God created and it's hard. It's not always easy. It's not always glamorous, but God's at work in it. And sometimes we can forget that because if marriage is hard, we can forget God uses the ordinary. God uses things like marriage to carry out his extraordinary plan. God uses parenting. If you're a parent here this morning, whether you're with l really little ones 
somewhere in between or your children are all out of the house and they were here for, for Christmas, it's a different season. But still parenting is always difficult. And it's easy to sometimes lose sight of how God is using something as mundane, it feels like, in his ordinary as the parenting day-to-day -day routines to advance his kingdom. It can be easy to think, how in the world, if you're, if you're a mom of, of, of a infant, how is God using me in changing all these diapers? I, mean, I could be out there doing something really big for God's kingdom. And I'm sleep deprived and changing diapers. And yet God is at work in the ordinary. And it's through the ordinary that he does his extraordinary work. Don't underestimate the importance of being a good friend. Aaron said a minute ago that him and I have had a friendship for over 10 years now, and I would just echo what he says. He is a dear friend, and I, the older I get, I realize there are some precious gifts God gives us in life. And young people, hear this. And I speak to young people because I think this is a, a, a struggle for, for younger, whether you are in elementary, high school, college, Friendships is based on all the wrong things often when you're, when you're younger. But I'm gonna tell you, a good friend is one of the most precious gifts on the planet. And don't underestimate that being a good friend to someone, it, it may not seem earth shattering. I mean, yeah, you could go be a missionary in Africa and do all of this really important work and you think, but here I am, you know, doing the dishes and changing diapers, mowing the lawn and, 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 and dealing with a friend who's going through a crisis. Am I really doing anything? Yeah, you are. God is at work in the ordinary, doing his extraordinary work. Can give you one more example. I mean, the list could be long. Just think of all of the things God calls us to do as a church member, as an employee, as a neighbor. If you're here this morning and you came to Christ because somebody shared the gospel with you, would you raise your hand? Look at that. The person who shared the gospel with you did something ordinary and obedient. God says, tell others about the good news, and they did it, and your life is forever changed. It was ordinary. It was obedience. It wasn't anything probably all that big to them at that moment. They were probably feared with, uh, filled with fear. What, what is this person going to say? think when I tell them about that God created them and that they have disobeyed God and that they have rejected a relationship with him and they deserve his punishment. And I'm going to tell them about Jesus who was born of a virgin, was laying in a manger and died on a cross. Nothing about that humanly sounds very appealing. And I'm gonna, but I'm going to tell them anyways. And if you saw it a minute ago and asked you to raise your hand, that was more than probably half of the room. You're here this morning because of obedience. Someone did what God said to do and God used them in an extraordinary way. I believe that Faithful obedience may be one of the most underrated and overlooked qualities in our culture today. Our culture loves the spectacular. Our culture loves the grandiose. But I think God often shines his light on the ordinary and the mundane and says, this is sometimes where I do my best work. And as God's people, I want to close out this year and begin a new year celebrating the ordinary moments of obedience because I think we can forget them. 
And I definitely don't think we celebrate them. Those moments that we go through day to day that may not look all that spectacular, here's the truth. God is working through them and in them. And I hope as you leave here today and as you go about your week and as you enter a new year that you will not for a moment ever forget how God is at work daily in ways that you will never know just through ordinary obedience. Here's the second truth we take away from this passage. We can really take away from all of Scripture. God accomplishes his extraordinary plan through the extraordinary life of Jesus. See, there, it would be a mistake to go to this passage this morning and isolate Joseph as if he was the main character. Anytime we read our Bible, whether we're in the Old Testament or the New Testament, th there are plenty of places where we are to learn from the example of a character in the Bible. A, maybe they're an example of faith. Maybe they're a, an example of a lack of faith. And we're to say, oh, wow, okay, that's a good example of what it looks like not to trust God. But if we only go to those people and see them as the primary character, we miss the point of scripture. Joseph isn't the primary character in this story, Jesus is. Joseph is only significant because he's connected with Jesus. That's what makes it okay that Joseph can just be ordinary. That's how God uses Joseph even though he's ordinary because it's not about how in, in, extraordinary and amazing Joseph is. It's about the one he belongs to. And because Joseph is connected with Jesus, Joseph does extraordinary things. And God uses him in extraordinary ways. See, my complete confidence that I can be ordinary and still be used to be a part of God's extraordinary plan is rooted in the extraordinary one, Jesus Christ. I can believe God can use me and I hope you leave here knowing that God can use you in extraordinary ways because of the extraordinary one. And Matthew goes to great lengths to speak of the extraordinary person and life of Jesus. One of the ways Matthew talks of Jesus is he speaks of his extraordinary nature. There is only one who was a hundred percent God, not partially God, not mostly God, all of God in human form. And with that nature, he was able to accomplish and do what we could never do. See, what every human priest failed to do because of their sin nature, he was able to do perfectly. Because he was in our flesh, he knows our weaknesses and can sympathize with them. But at the same time, he didn't give in to them as Adam and Abraham and Noah and Moses and every other character who might have been used of God but eventually fail. There is one in the Bible who lived a perfectly obedient life, and that's Jesus. And because of his perfect obedience, I'm not living on the treadmill of works in my perfect obedience. It doesn't cancel out the importance of doing what God has commanded us to do. As I've said for these last few minutes, God uses our ordinary obedience, but it's not about my ordinary obedience that makes me useful to God. It's about Jesus' perfect obedience that makes me useful to God because I'm with him and because he lived the righteous life I've never lived and you will never live, he died to pay for my disobedience and he rose again and intercedes on my behalf. I can strive to be obedient to God knowing that when I'm not, God isn't done with me because of the extraordinary 
nature of Jesus. Matthew also talks about in his gospel the extraordinary power of Jesus. If you were to thumb through the gospel of Matthew, you would see time and time and time again how Jesus has extraordinary power. Power over sickness, death, Satan, the, the natural world, even over the grave. So those moments that I can have, that you can have, where we are so aware of our weaknesses and we feel so powerless, guess what? My hope in being used by God is not in my strength, it's in his. Because when I'm weak, he has a power that is perfect. And guess what? I belong to him. So his power, I get to connect to. I get to use. I get to go in his name and ask that he would do things that left to myself that I cannot do. Not only is Jesus extraordinary in his nature and his power, but Matthew makes it abundantly clear he's extraordinary in his mission. No one in the history of the world has ever accomplished what Jesus accomplished in those few hours on the cross. If you care about the lost, whether they're your children, a friend, a family member, a neighbor, a coworker, sometimes you can feel the weight of, of their lostness on you and even feel like, oh God, I, I, I know I'm not responsible for their salvation. At the same time, the weight of their eternity weighs on me. Guess what? The weight of all, everybody's eternity weighed on Jesus. And you know what? He accomplished what no one else ever could. When he uttered those words, it is finished. The weight of everyone's salvation was resting upon him. And when he uttered those words, we get to hear him and go, yes, I don't have to worry anymore. Well, I finished the race. What if I'm not obedient enough? We hear those words of Jesus and we go, I can rest in his grace that he finished it, he completed it. And all I can do is put my eyes on him and be faithful and strive after the things he's called me to strive after. But there's one more truth we must not forget as we close. Jesus is still extraordinary to this day. And here's the reason I say that, because if you think about the way Matthew's gospel closes, after Jesus completes his work on the cross and he's placed in the grave and then he rises again on the third day as he said he would, he goes to his disciples and he commissions them to go out and to do his work in his name. But here's what he tells them, that he will be with them to the end. See, it matters that Jesus rose from the dead. It matters for many reasons, but here's one of the reasons. Jesus' work, his perfect life, his perfect obedience, his perfect power, his complete mission is still at work because he's not done yet. He's still at work. He may not be on planet earth, but he's in a better place. He's in heaven and his work is still going on today. And he doesn't send out his church in a way to say, okay, I did my part, now you do yours. No, he sends us out and says, you're gonna do my work, but I'm gonna do it through you. So we don't look at this huge task of obedience and the redemptive plan of God and say, God, how in the world could we ever do this? How could we ever accomplish this? We look at it with faith because we see the extraordinary life of Jesus and what he accomplished. And we say, God, please use me to be a part of it. Not because there's anything in me that, that makes me capable or worthy, but because I have confidence and have faith that I can be a part of this work because 
of the extraordinary person of Jesus. I'm confident that if I spend my life pursuing Jesus, not perfectly, but faithfully pursuing Jesus and pointing people to Jesus, God will use me to be a part of his extraordinary plan of redemption. And I hope as you leave here today, you have that same confidence. Once again, not because of any gifts you have or because of a past you have or because of, of a position you have, but because you belong to the extraordinary one. And he's not done yet. And he wants to use you and your ordinary obedience to carry out his extraordinary work. So as we close, I pray, and this has been my prayer coming into this morning. I pray that as you close out this year and begin a new year, I pray that you would be motivated to whatever changes you feel like God is calling you to make in your life. I pray that you would make those changes motivated by faith. And let's be honest, at this time of the year, how often are we motivated by some other thing like fear, guilt, envy? We want to do something different because we, we, we feel so guilty or because of fear or, or whatever else may motivate us. But I want us to leave here today motivated by faith. If there's areas that you are not being obedient in, I hope that you first and foremost realize your obedience that makes you right with God was purchased by Jesus. And you will never be more obe obedient enough to be loved by him. You already are because of the obedience of the perfect son of God. And I pray that where you look at areas you need to obey and grow in obedience, that you would not be motivated to change for any other reason but because of faith. I've got faith, Lord, to believe that you can use my life in great ways if I just keep my eyes on you. And if you're here this morning and you're discouraged, maybe more than you're convicted because you are doing the most you can, it may never be enough, you think, but you're doing the most you can. And yet, at the end of the day, when you think about your life, you don't feel like you're doing enough. And you wonder, God, am I even useful for your kingdom? I hope that you leave here today with a heart full of faith, knowing that God is for you. And that if you keep your eyes on him, he will use you and he has already used you in ways you may never know this side of eternity. And that that would just cause you to stay the course and, and continue to pursue after him. Let's pray. Ask the Lord now to take this truth and apply it to our hearts. Father in heaven, you have been so kind to give us your word. You have been so kind to tell us truths that, Lord, we can forget. Now the harder part is taking these truths and actually responding to them. Because we confess, Lord, our hearts are, are sometimes just a mess. We can hear truths like this and the enemy of our soul can come in and begin to even talk us out of the truths we hear on the way home. So Lord, I pray for every person here this morning. Whatever they heard from this message this morning, I pray that they would leave here more aware of how you are doing your extraordinary work and the ordinary daily obedience that fills all of our lives, all the opportunities we have today and tomorrow just to do the things you've called us to do. Father, I pray that we would leave here today motivated with faith as we close out this year, as we look over last year, and maybe we see areas we need to grow, we wouldn't be discouraged. We wouldn't be debilitated. 
we would look to you where necessary we would confess our weaknesses and our sin and we would believe in this new year that you're not finished with us yet that you are still going to work in us and through us if we just keep our eyes on you Father, help us now. You've been so good to us to give us your word. I pray for your sustaining work as we leave here to hold these truths close to our hearts so that we would remember what you've done so that we can live in ways that, Lord, would, would do your kingdom work in this city and beyond. We love you only because you first loved us. We thank you for today. We thank you for this reminder. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. It is a gift for any church to have pastor friends who will point their eyes, point our eyes to the extraordinary Savior, point our eyes to what Matthew is talking about, that this was the Son, the true and ultimate Son of God, and that for ordinary sinners, he provides a way of salvation, and that he is with those sinners always to the end of the age who trust in him. So, since we've received that gift of that kind of direction for us at the end of this year, can we just thank Josh for driving up here with his family to serve us in that way? As the year ends, I want to encourage you to do something. Um, it's, it's related to Josh, Josh's message, uh, but I want to uh, also just speak pastorally for a moment. Um, anytime there's a, there's a marker like the end of a year or a birthday or uh, even just the sun rising in the morning, uh, we want to seize that as an opportunity to do two things. One, to direct our gaze to Jesus in trust and confidence in his gospel, which is what Josh was exhorting us to do. This is the extraordinary Savior. And we need to fix our gaze on him as the new year approaches, not on how we did this year, not on what we'd like to do next year. Make your first resolution to fix your gaze on Jesus Christ. And then as you do that, recount the incredible, innumerable blessings of grace that you have received in him. That This year has been full of the evidences of God's grace. Uh, if, you, if you imagine the Christmas morning present gift giving, uh, we have received so many presents this year uh, from, the, from the kindness of God through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Let me encourage you as families, recount those blessings. Our minds drift to presumption when they should drift towards gratefulness. Let me encourage you, fix your eyes on Jesus as the year comes to a conclusion, and then look back and recount the gifts of God's grace, those that are true every year and those that are particular to this year. I mean, encourage you to do that as a church. We want to end the year grateful and Christ-centered every time, every year, every marker, every day we want to do that. So let me encourage you to do that as the year ends. As your pastors, Aaron and I are so grateful to God for you. We love you. We are overjoyed at the grace of God at work in your lives, in your relationships, in your faithful servanthood to this church, in your love for one another. We love you, and it is a joy and an honor to be a church family together. God be with you. Have a grace-filled New Year's Eve and New Year's Day, and we'll see you next Sunday.